In front of the cops is a sturdy house. It is neatly shut up, and there is an undisturbed layer of dirt on the front porch. Crack. No one responds to your knock, and the door is locked. But a barrel below the window affords easy access inside. As you poke your head in, there's a whistle, and a rope catches your neck. Listen up. You're gonna go, and you're never gonna come back, and you're not telling anyone about us. The person speaking jerks the rope around your neck for emphasis. Stop it! Someone else shouts. I said, I'm not staying if you hurt people. That's the second voice, the wo- No, it's a child. If we don't keep our home secret, how are we going to be safe? The girl glances at her sullen companion before addressing you. I'm very sorry, but you're not welcome. The girl works her lip. The way the crowd jeers when she walks out, you're expecting a lurid freak show. But when she starts to sing, her voice is light and warm, rich on the ears. The audience falls into a rapt silence. We find love in the strangest places. I was a broker before the country went to shit. Now, this place is doing better than any bank. It's the truth. No matter people can barely afford to feed themselves, they'll come here. They need to be reminded that there's joy and spectacle in the world. He pauses. And music. When the show's over, you see them together, arm in arm. You drink the night away with them. She's quick to laugh and quick to make others laugh. Lightning starts in the next valley over. Then the wind picks up. The long grass hisses. And suddenly, it's raining so hard you can barely breathe without a hand over your mouth. The lightning momentarily illuminates a farmhouse on the opposite hilltop. The only one for miles. Much closer, though, is a silhouette of a dilapidated barn. You pound and pound on the door of the house, but you only get confused shouts from inside. Soon, you give up and head to the unlocked shed, where the empty wood bin makes a good enough bed. In the morning, you're woken suddenly by the sound of clattering china. A tiny old woman bends over you, 
silently offering you coffee. White Rider, don't come to claim me for I had my time. same litter, more like some community of strays. They rub against the little girl's ankles, showering her with affection while paying you no mind. Do grown-ups like cats? The girl thinks real hard, hand on chin, while she deciphers the implications of your statement. I mean some grown-ups don't like cats? She looks gravely upset. Your question animates the girl, who points at the cats one by one. Here's Milton, and Maurice, and Gertrude. This goes on a while. Whenever she seems about done, the horde grows. You reach for a black cat, who ducks and weaves to evade your touch. Another cat hisses at you. For what reason, who can know? You find her at a crossroads in the dark, lit by a tiny brazier turning something fragrant and smoky. All around are the dried stems and petals of a dozen strange plants. You! Her voice is powerful belying her size. You seem like you could do with powerful magic. For you, no charge. We have a friend in common. She taps her nose knowingly. How practical, how clever. She sprinkles powder and grains onto the burning coals, filling the smoke with strange and acrid smells. Her eyes red like coals. Stare right into yours as you spit it out. How curious. The magic won't cling to you. 
It slides off your shade like water off a duck. Off with you. Your only wealth is in tales. Your only riches are verses. <laughs> Hey, where you going, friend? Two figures hop down and around a grassy knoll. One long and ropey and human, a bindle on his shoulder. The other, a lean little dog, tawny as the Mojave Desert. The man says nothing, only looks at you. His eyes pinpoints a gray under the slouch of his hat. Something squirms in his bindle. The dog, which doesn't look much like a dog up close, but something wilder. Its ears long and its amber-washed eyes. It flops onto its back, squirming, paws bent, tongue drooping between its teeth. Hell are you stopping for? Me? I'm just playing a game with my mate. He's gone into hiding, and I gotta find him. Once I find him, it's my turn. Ben's his name these days, I think. We don't keep track of such silliness. When you're old enough to remember when the first story was born, you learn not to sweat the little things. The coyote, illusions shed like a winter coat, sits herself, Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Madame Mina's fabulous boa constrictor is a highlight of Runciter's circus. The boy is uncertain. The snake flicks his nose with Mina standing over a man in blue overalls. Her constrictor is wrapped around his ankle. The animals are miserable. He tries to crawl, but you try to pry Paul off. But he grips strong. Inside this lonely farmhouse, a pair of children, no older than six or seven, are waiting in a cart. One is holding the reins with an easy confidence, as if the cart is his. The other stares at you. Where are your parents, you ask? The driver simply guffaws. Not here, thank goodness, he says. Just then, a third child carrying a leather doctor's bag. The driver just shakes his head. His plump little hands give the reins a quick flick. And a humble parlor. In the armchair under the window is a girl no older than five. Nearly ninety, she says. Oh, don't look at me like that. I know I've got the face of a wee child. 
So does Dr. You heard of changeling children? In the old country, people feared us. But mostly they fear. The hills are quiet now, they say. People sigh and wonder where all that... She nods. Her smile... cursory nod as you pass, which he mistakes for interest. Wondering where you've seen me before? He beams. How about on the roundabout roads and twisting trails of America the Beautiful? Yes, I'm Walking Willis. It's Walking Willis. Funny, most folks know old Walking Willis. I've been walking across this great country back and forth for years now. You see, I ain't got a home. Walking's all I do. I'm always walking. Don't need it, friend. He winks. You keep that in your heart, and good walking to you. slip into a booth near the back, where it's too dark for people to see you haven't bought a drink. Up on stage, a slight little man approaches the microphone. He utters a long, sustained series of low, loud notes. Just you head out to the front of the building.
cop stopped a truck from the nearby army base. The driver is furious. He yells, Hey! Get over here! Shit. You approach, and he tries to give you a case of liquor. Run this half a mile down to the base. I'll give you something nice, orders the driver. Ridiculous, the cop blusters. You shake your head and leave. You hear the bottles shatter. You lie down for a nap in an abandoned rail car. Delighted to find it still has actual berths, but wake to the sway of a carriage in motion, the rhythmic rattle of the rails, and the crack of gunfire. The porter is one of the biggest men you've ever seen. He holds out a hand. Don't trouble yourself. He addresses the carriage. His voice rattles your rib cage. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain calm. I shall have this situation resolved shortly. Four bandits on horses keep pace with the train, trading shots with someone in a carriage further ahead. The porter slips out of your car. Isn't Joe a wonder? Says the woman seated next to you. He's been on his feet for hours already. You hear heavy feet on the roof. Joe's booming voice vibrates through the carriage as he addresses the bandits. You don't hear what he says, but after a minute, the bandits slow their horses and drop back from view. Joe re-enters. Is everyone all right? Joe smiles. Thank you. I don't get no tips till the end of the run. You don't know how you got here. But it's hard not to feel safe under Joe's watch. You wake up back in the disused train yard. In the dawn light, you see the rusting stock here was laid to rest long ago. You leave an offering on your berth and slip. Some students have paused their long walk home to rest on the bank of this clear, shallow pond. Above them, a plane makes low and hazy loop-de-loops. They gaze into the water. A young man points at a girl who stands alone on the shore. Her dad's in the plane, he murmurs. We stop here every day to see him. He points into the pond, and you realize that the plane is flying under the water. The girl drops to her knees and stretches her hands into the pond. And when her father roars around the loop of the shore, his engines splash mud all over her clothes. Papa! She sobs and lunges. You all drag her away from the water's edge. Her eyes are fixed on her father's reflection in the sky. It fades. The pond grows still. And the sound of the engines grows quiet. He's waiting for me, she whispers. I'll fly with him one day. He promised that I would. the two musicians on the corner, playing no louder than a murmur. The blind one to the left 
doesn't sing so much as moan. If we are willing, he will teach us to love our brothers, to dance and sing. It continues. We dream of his seat in heaven, our realm. Our heads his flowers ring. Oh, Prince in heaven, we sing for rapture. We all must perish, our flowers and our names. But the flowers in our prince's kingdom, they shall not perish. They shall remain. There is a joy there, and there is friendship. For our passage, we shall sing. We dream of his seed in heaven. You throw him a coin. Obliged. They b- Across the street from this bar, a man in full uniform stares fixedly at the horizon. The older guys on the porch are watching him with an expression you read as deep distaste. That boy wasn't in the war, one tells you. His older brother died in France. The junior here tells people he fought, and he stands there in the middle of town once or twice a week in his brother's uniform, so we gotta see it. You're damn right. It's crime, I think, the old man says. Cups his hands around his mouth, and Junior gives you the exact kind of matte finish stare you always see on men who left themselves behind in the war. I don't expect you to understand me, he drawls. This is the way it's got to be. fence post at the border of the farm. Fields have been stripped clean. A man lies on his front in the dirt, seeds spilling out from the sack he holds in one hand. Please. His voice thin with exhaustion. You take the sack. The bird's heads turn in rhythm as six eyes assess you. More. The bird crows with rage. The bird gouges your arm. You bat it away.
The only place in town that will let you through the door is a smoky windowed lounge advertising cheap drinks and sweet voiced singers. When the singer comes on stage, though, something about him seems familiar. The other guests recognize him too. They all bolt out the door. The manager rushes on stage. There are a few wild-eyed diehards left near the stage. You take your place at the microphone. The fanatics gather at your feet. You're not sure what you sing. It escapes your ears somehow. But while you're on stage, you hold their lives in your fist. They'd take bullets for you. As soon as it's over, the feeling's gone, and you won't be getting it back. jingles, and the tired-looking waitress flinches. At the Formica counter, a woman grabs her son to her, pinning his arms. Wasn't me this time, I swear! Not serving anybody till I make sure that boy doesn't cause another racket. She snaps. He's a menace. Last week his mama bought him a trumpet, drove my regulars crazy. He's music mad, but he can't carry a tune to save his life. The waitress winces. Suddenly, a tinkling... Afternoon! The fish nods affably. He swings his catch over his shoulder, grunting with effort. Got a big one today. Gonna eat it while it's fresh. They're welcome to join me. There's plenty to go around. He works with practice deficiency. To remove the shirt, the fish cradles the body in his arm. The fish trims the man's hair, head, chest. Some eat meat, but refuse to prepare it. Perhaps you're one of those. We're all hypocrites about something. The fish chuckles. <laughs> As you will. this construction site, basking in the bitter sun. 
Upon his head is a silver crown shrouded in tongues of pale fire. Laborers periodically wander past, seemingly unconcerned. The bull catches your eye. The bull arches his head languidly away from you. I'm waiting for my friend, he informs you airily. This bustling farm has a strange layout. A central farmhouse, stately in its age, surrounded by smaller outbuildings, like apartments. Number of folks go about their chores around it, children running through the gardens. Two people approach when they see you. Hello, stranger. A shorter one, androgynous, calls with a smile. The other, a tall man looks on with suspicion. We don't get many visitors out here. Looking around, the people at the farm don't look like a family. Too many adults of all shape. You say you're just a traveler looking for a place to sleep and have no desire to intrude on their lives. You wander the grounds. See two black men playing with their child. A pair of women. You learn their names, their relationships. The men are the child's fathers. One of the women birthed them. These are people who have found a home and a family here when the rest of the world turned its back. This boy is capable of some intimidating eye contact. Lovely and round, he says. Oh, a pearl. That's right. Now your prize. Following a sinking limestone cliff, you see the fossilized impressions of crustaceans clearly scattered across the stone. Long ago, this place must have been a shallow sea. Then something strange ahead catches your eye. Leaning against the stone is a figure draped in a black cloth, arms crossed, with a bull's skull for a head. This ghoulish configuration is about 30 paces away from you, but as far as you can tell, hasn't registered your presence. You look down at your weathered bones, a curse only you can see. You decide it's best not to be judged. Hey! He calls back, in a voice much kinder and softer than you were expecting. You weren't even Behind the mask of bone is a shawl-wrapped young woman, mid-teens and tall for her age. I ruined my dress with this dark dye, too. Mom's gonna whoop me bad, I bet. I keep destroying them, but does she stop making me wear them? No. Turning the skull to face herself, she mimics what you assume is her family. Act like a decent lady, Suze. Oh, don't lose your head, Suze. She pauses. Have you ever been so close to someone it was like they were a part of you? Losing them would be like losing an arm. Or Maddie. The girl says, kicking at the dirt. What? No! 
She balks. I, I, I mean, what's the point? He suggests that right over the next hour, she works on the letter. That'd be great. She beams. One's got a wild spirit to her, she remarks, sweat pooling under her dark brown eyes. The car, halted in the middle of her garage, is a groaning, hulking beast. A gorgeous pre-Ford monster. A ghost, a white, a soul, whatever you want to call it. Course cars have them, she sighs. But every year... There's less wild ones and more of these... She strokes the swooping hood of the luxury car like one might groom a prize stallion. These beauties. Not even their owners really understand them. But today's... It is. And it should be. She cackles. C.P. Pennebaker. The dandy approaches seconds after you enter the saloon. C.P. Pennebaker. You find yourself once again at Runciter Circus. Mina gives you a cautious look, but can't hide her delight at the baby tiger in her arms. Sitka, the tiger. The tiger's fur is incredibly soft. That man was wrong to hurt the animals. She presses her lips together. You're right. at you, a smile spreading on his face. You feel exposed. He snorts, possibly in mirth. No. He taps it. It's an elixir. He opens his mouth wide to shape each syllable. There are these, but everybody gotta have a chance to see. Catch a sign. There are people shouting and laughing and WPA, planting, yeah, but I have money now. Three delivery trucks sit on the waterfront, their drivers securing the cargo. Twelve cop cars form a protective half ring around them. Their occupants seem to be gearing up for combat. You approach a pair of cops. 
The broad one pushes shells into a shotgun with a practiced motion and an undercurrent of excitement. His wiry partner indicates the trucks. We gotta get these through. Keep them secure. The broad cop grunts. You been living under a rock? Strikers, says the other. Socialist. The broad cop sneers. Does it matter? They better fall in line. The other shakes his head. My cousin's out there. I don't think their demands are... It's a token act of resistance, but it's something. You drop onto your belly, the car between you and the gathered cop. You stand to find the thin cop watching. He looks between... He's not coming over to you, is he? Hello there! Bang! He smacks you across the face. The gentle breeze sways the man on his horse. Poor fellow must be having himself a saddle nap. Down here, stranger. You're sure the man's lips didn't move? Hey, asshole. The horse's grotesque tongue slap. A little drool rolls out of the old man's mouth. Thick and foamy. That's what I said. Saliota Hortense. Jesus, what's your issue? It's nearly Christmas. Many are drinking liberally. A man staggers up from a downstairs bar and falls over the top step. Help me! People tut at the man's drunken state. A woman tosses a coin at him without even looking. 
The drunk clasps it. You press a cloth on the wound, and he hisses with agony. Another man, the Stetson wearing man. I found her, you know. Suddenly, you don't quite recall what led you down the path to wander through this cotton field. He walks alongside you, taking particular pleasure with each stalk of cotton trampled underfoot. Always would, of course. Didn't need help. You place his accent somewhere between Baltimore and Golgotha. Never know who your friends are. His face unhinges into a smile. A process that involves only his teeth. Now we know. His eyes. Two dark pinpricks on off-white eyeballs seem to stare right through your skull. And then... All you see is the afterimage of the descending sun. He's sitting by the side of the road on a rough wooden box, 
one side of it covered in hefty brass latches. Hey, friend. You want to buy a... Um... The box buckles underneath him. Listen, I'll give it to you for free. He's sweating a little. Something dark and icarus oozes through the cracks in the box. Just take it. He's a really good boy. He's just not... The box almost throws him off with a sudden jostle. He's just not how strained is all. You won't regret it, he says, already leaping off the box. You're very slightly relieved to see it has a carry handle on it. In the moment it takes you to get a hold of the box, the man is gone, blowing a cloud of road dust behind him. It seems tailor-made to hold whatever's inside it. You give it a gentle tap, and it responds with a violent shake. You undo one latch, and the other one flies open. All you see emerging from a pool of ichor is a squamous blur, grasping with amorphous appendages as it vanishes into the undergrowth. I'm gonna have to my spade up upon my 